On today's episode, SpaceX is building something massive, NASA uses a force field on the moon, Sierra tests a space drop pod, and we say goodbye to the Delta IV Heavy. Hidden within a seemingly mundane pep talk for SpaceX employees, Elon Musk revealed something massive about the future of Starship. Not just the company's next step with their super heavy rocket prototypes, Elon laid out the end game for making life multiplanetary. We are working off a relatively simple infographic here, but there's a lot of subtle detail that reveals more than just what Elon said out loud. What we are looking at is the intended evolution of the already massive Starship through two new versions, each one increasing payload capacity and consequently thrust, propellant load, and of course, size. Version 2 shows a slight change over the current prototype. It's just slightly taller, with about an extra meter on the booster and an extra 2 meters on the upper stage. That 2 meter stretch on the ship stage allows for a significant increase in propellant load, which translates to an increase in thrust from 1,250 tons to 1,600 tons. This is playing a major role in getting the overall payload capacity up over 100 tons to low Earth orbit. Beyond the numbers, we can spot some visual differences in these renderings that seem to have been done intentionally, starting at the nose. It looks pointier, there's a more dramatic taper down to the tip of the nose cone, and that's probably accentuated by longer and more narrow wing flaps up there as well. There's a similar trend at the base of the ship. The wing flaps stick out a little further, and we can see that the heat shield tiles definitely cover more of the ship's hull around the base. Below that, the interstage has been totally redesigned with significantly more room for ventilation during the hot stage separation. This is more of a Soviet-style interstage connection like what we saw on the old N1. We can also see that the booster's grid fins have moved down and further away from the interstage. If we had to guess, it would probably be safe to say that these changes to the booster have been made to reduce damage from the hot stage event which should hopefully lead to better booster control on re-entry. And getting to the base of the Super Heavy, SpaceX is illustrating that they've removed the outer shield around the Raptor engines, probably just a best part is no part decision. Version 2 really feels like the intended baseline for a finished version of Starship. Version 3, however, feels like a monster by comparison. Going just by the numbers Elon gave at the presentation, V3 stands a total of 150 meters, which is taller than the current launch tower at Starbase. The V3 ship almost looks comically long at nearly 20 meters taller than V1, but it's being done for a good reason, Starship 3 will hold nearly double the propellant of current prototypes. And unlike V2, SpaceX is intending on increasing the V3's vacuum engines, doubling them from 3 to 6. This is going to push the thrust of the ship stage to 2,700 tons of force, which is more than double the current prototype. The result is going to be a capability to deploy over 200 metric tons to low Earth orbit, and with orbital refilling, that 200 tons can then be transported to the moon and all the way to Mars. Obviously, SpaceX has a long road to walk before they get anywhere close to this monstrous version of their Starship. Recent test flights of the V1 prototype have yet to even make a controlled descent, and the company is hard at work building more test articles for a busy year that will get the current version ready for use in time for the Artemis 3 moon landing scheduled for 2026. On top of that, the V3 will clearly need a more robust launch facility. A taller tower is a given, but with almost 3,000 extra tons of force at liftoff, it's not clear that the new deluge system on the orbital launch mount could stop this thing from blowing a new hole in the Boca Chica coast. Elon says the driving force for developing new Starship types, aside from achieving mind-numbing power, is to continue lowering the cost of each vehicle. Musk says that the team is targeting about $2 million per launch of a fully reusable Starship B3, well under the currently estimated $67 million price tag on launching the Falcon 9, the current workhorse of SpaceX. So while it's a little early to get excited for Starship B3 before V2 is even built, or before the prototype achieves its first landing, the idea of scaling up this dramatically while cutting relative cost so much is pretty wild. Lunar missions have many dangers associated with them before they even reach the surface, but 
there's one major issue that NASA needs to solve before we can really take up permanent residence on our moon, and that's the dust. Lunar regolith is made up of a high quantity of glassy silicates, and without oxygen or flowing water, there's nothing to erode the material and smooth it out, leaving coarse and abrasive shards like unrefined sand. To make matters worse, the dust is electrostatically charged, so you can't just brush it off as the particles only cling on and cause more damage, and just like sand, it gets everywhere. Gaskets, seals, hatches, Apollo astronauts even reported allergic-like reactions after removing suits caked in moon dust, coining the phrase lunar hay fever. Later studies on the phenomenon showed that inhaling moon dust could lead to a whole host of lung issues. So, knowing this and glancing nervously at their upcoming schedule for Artemis crewed missions to the lunar surface, NASA dusted off an old idea, the electric curtain. Back in 1967, NASA engineers had the thought that an opposing charge could be used to simply repel the electrostatic dust particles much more safely than a brush or vacuum. The administration never got it off the ground for the Apollo missions, but since 2004, they've been perfecting a modern version called the Electrodynamic Dust Shield. With a few well-placed transparent electrodes, the system generates a mild electric field that can repel moon dust from almost anything. Spacesuits are an obvious thought, but also delicate solar panels, thermal radiators, and camera lenses. Testing for the EDS has been running since 2019, when the system was installed in 12 test panels made of different materials and some modern spacesuit fabric, but the EDS has already made it to the moon as well. When Intuitive Machines sent their Odysseus lander to the lunar surface back in February, it carried a series of experiments with it, including several camera lenses equipped with a prototype of the EDS. Odysseus tipped over as it landed, but the IM team managed to gather data from a couple of functional experiments, including the new dust shield system. Going even further, NASA has planned for an EDS tech demo to land with a mission for their Eclipse initiative, slated for later this year, run by Firefly Aerospace. Moon dust is one of those problems that seems much smaller until your gear is losing its seal from particle infiltration and your astronauts are sneezing their brains out. So if we're going to actually set up a functional base on the moon, or really anywhere with dust and no atmosphere, we are going to have to get systems like the EDS up and running as soon as possible. It's the end of an era. The United Launch Alliance gave their Delta IV rocket a final send-off Tuesday, April 9th, as the venerable heavy lift craft ignited its engines and flew into space one last time. The mission, dubbed NROL-70, was carrying a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office, which seems to have been some sort of observation satellite, and marked the end of not just the Delta IV Heavy, but the entire Delta family of rockets. The Delta IV itself has been flying since 2002 in various configurations, and even in the very beginning, it was a platform that was mostly given over to the US Air Force, although as time went on, non-military and commercial missions were taken on, especially after the United Launch Alliance took over the rocket from Boeing in 2006. Built on three common booster core segments and a 5 meter diameter upper stage, the Delta IV Heavy took the 826 kilonewton max thrust of the strongest medium variant and pushed it to 3,140 kilonewtons. The Heavy flew a total of 16 missions, one of which suffered a partial failure. The Delta IV has had its retirement plan for some time, as the ULA designed and built their new Vulcan Heavy rocket to replace the aging Delta IV system. 22 years is a long time for any vehicle designed to operate, but especially with the advances to rocketry in these last two decades, the time was right to let the Delta line ride off into the sunset. It sounds like something from a first-person shooter, but Sierra Space has announced that they are developing a cargo delivery system that could send critical supplies to battlefields and disaster zones anywhere in the world inside 90 minutes. It's called Ghost, and Sierra Space envisions it as a quick way to get prepackaged supplies into very remote places. The idea is for the company to place a large number of prepackaged and sealed pods in low Earth orbit. Again, these can be filled with things like disaster supplies, medicine, emergency food, and even weapons and equipment. Once called, the system activates the closest pod and begins decelerating. An umbrella-like fabric heat shield will protect the payload while a deceleration device slows down its orbit, and the whole thing falls to within 100 yards of the design coordinates. And this isn't just a concept, 
they've already completed the first drop tests last month. The testing included terminal velocity testing from 2,000 feet up, which basically means that they dropped the payload capsule without a parachute to test how tough it is and how it falls. From there, they tested a standard parachute deployment at 4,000 feet, and then finally a fall where the shield separates on the way down, allowing for a different landing profile. Ghost capsules have an expected lifespan of five years, so the system is meant to be a sort of contingency plan that will work best if they have enough in orbit to cover the potential need. Sierra Space is the company behind the new Dream Chaser space planes, due to be tested on the next ULA Vulcan launch, and that's because they don't have a rocket of their own yet, if they ever will. But with both SpaceX and Rocket Lab in the planning phases, for a reusable system on a much larger scale, it's clear Sierra saw this need and decided to fill a part of the market that they could handle. Sierra might not be able to fly a Humvee across the world like SpaceX plans, but they can have something small ready to go and land in any area with or without a landing facility within 90 minutes. Clever as usual, Sierra.